Hello, welcome to League of Women Voters Presents the next big election. I'm Judith Pranis, a member of the League, and four guests are with me today to explain why the upcoming municipal election may have more impact on your life and more impact on your pocketbook than the election held last November. You thought November was big? Wait until you see what's on the ballot this spring. Now, I should note before we begin that none of my guests is running for office this spring. The League never supports candidates or political parties, and the views expressed in this program are not necessarily those of BCTV or the League of Women Voters. Now, we're going to put up some slides to show you what offices we will be electing this spring. Then our guests will tell you about these offices and how they affect your lives. And we may have an, even have some tips on running for offices. May we show the slides, please? Okay, let me just get my copy because we're not, we're not seeing the slides where we are. But statewide, we have ballot questions to amend the Constitution. We're not sure what all those are yet, but we're guaranteed pretty much that there will be some. We'll be electing Supreme Court Justice. On the Superior Court, we'll be electing a justice, and there are two retention elections. We'll talk about that later. And on the Commonwealth Court, we have a justice to elect, or two justices to elect, and two retentions. Now, locally, we will be electing two judges of our Court of Common Pleas. Uh, there will also be two retentions in that election. And we have six magisterial district judges that are up for probably retention, but one of those could end up being an open seat and being an election. And we do have a judge with us today to explain what that's all about. Uh, on our county offices, we're electing our coroner, our prothonotary, and our treasurer. And on school boards, we'll be electing those in all 18 districts. Each serves a four-year term. About half of the nine-member board is elected in each municipal election, so every two years. And our boroughs, we have 26 of them. They'll be electing mayors, council members, and tax collectors. Our townships, there are 45 of those. They'll be electing either supervisors or commissioners. They both do pretty much the same job. Auditors and tax collectors. And in the city of Reading, we'll be electing a president of council uh, and two city council uh, members, one from District 4 and one from District 5. And in every city, borough, and township, we're electing a constable. It's a big election. So my guests today are Allison Wilson. She is president of the Exeter School Board. Judge Tonya Butler, who is our judicial magistrate in District Court 3-9. Michael Malinowski, who is the Muhlenberg Township Solicitor, Supervisor, excuse me, and Gary Kraft, who is the Mayor of Moton. So, Allison, let's start with you. What do school boards do? Well, school boards are the governing body of a school district. So they make policy for the administration, the students, and the teachers to follow. Tell us a little bit more. What specifically are you looking at? Is it just budgets? Are you deciding what should be taught in the schools? What are the most important things that you can think of that you do in your time as well, a school? Absolutely. Budget is one of our big things that we do. Um, every spring, we're looking carefully at the budget um, to, to see what expenses the expenses will be for the year. Um, we finalize our budget in June and then um, the tax year runs July to July. Another thing is that we look at curriculum and we approve textbooks that the students will be using. Um, we also look at all different policy um, from, you know, this year a big one would be like our health, our health and safety policy. Um, but also policies for teachers to follow, for lesson planning, um, and for students to follow in athletics. So it's a wide um, range of different policies that we look at. And I'm guessing, because I have been to school board meetings, that you also have to decide when you need new school buses and what the transportation routes are. Yep. Yeah, we don't really have to decide what the routes are, but um, we, do, we do a lot with the transportation. So yes. So... Let's, let's move on and get what everybody does. Judge Butler, tell us what a district judge does. Hello. 
Okay, so for a magisterial district judge, we call them MDJs. Mo we are the community judge. Most people know about the main courthouse downtown um, at six and downtown Reading at six and court. But very few people know that we have magisterial district judges in Berks County. There are 17 of us and we all have our own little mini court and offices. We are often the first um, introduction into the court system for many people. So we handle criminal and to tell you a little bit about what we do with criminal, when the police um, arrest their suspect, they bring them into, a lot of times they're brought into custody they don't have to be brought into custody, but very often they are. And the MDJs will arraign the defendants. We tell them what charges they are facing. We advise them of their rights. We tell them about their preliminary hearing, which is their first opportunity to defend against the charges. And we set their bail. Also with criminal, we sign, read and sign arrest warrants and search warrant. Uh, also handle summary cases. We do harassment. We hand, we preside over um, disorderly conduct cases. We handle traffic cases. We handle um, property maintenance citations or any other municipal ordinance violation cases, we'll handle them. We also preside over the preliminary hearing. So a defendant, that is, like I said earlier, their first opportunity to defend against a charge. So we're deciding whether or not a crime was committed and if this individual probably committed that crime. And if we decide that, if we decide both of those and the affirmative, then their case proceeds on to the Court of Common Pleas. If we decide that either the crime was not committed or that the Commonwealth has not proven that this person probably committed the crime, well, then we have the ability to dismiss those actions. We also handle civil. So we handle landlord-tenant cases. If a landlord feels as though uh, the tenant has violated one of the provisions on the lease, they bring a landlord tenant action to the magisterial district judge and we will decide whether or, or not um, or, or which side we are going to find and whether we're gonna issue a judgment in that case or not. We also handle cases less than $12,000. So um, I get a lot of credit card companies who file actions against um, individuals because the individuals are not living up to the promises that they made to pay the credit cards. So as long as it's less than $12,000, I can hear it. Also, we get neighbor disputes or, or even family member disputes. If one person, maybe um, you loaned your your brother or your best friend a thousand dollars and they promise to pay, but they're not paying it back. Those cases would come to your uh, magisterial district judge in your district and we'll hear those type of cases. Um, also, I have some used car lots in my district and so I, for a point there, I had a rash of people who were dissatisfied with the cars that they were receiving from the car lot. And so they would bring a complaint against the car lot and they come to the MDJ. We also do uh, weddings. You know, we have the ability to marry people, which is always very nice. In fact, I have a wedding right after this program. And we hear payment determination hearings. So if people were given fines for either maybe uh, a traffic citation that they received or a property maintenance citation that they received, uh, 
they would come and pay their fines in our courts. And we also, we run our court and our, our offices, just like any other business. We have bills we have to pay. I, I sign checks. I have three secretaries who handle the phones. They schedule appointments. Um, and they look to their magisterial district judge as their leader. So that gives you a little bit of what we do. <laughs> Probably the broadest of, of all the people we have here. And I was thinking one thing that connects you to Allenson would be the, the truancy things, that you have to deal with truant students sometimes. That is correct. I, and I neglected to mention that, but yes. Uh, if And I'm in Northeast Reading. So if Reading School District files a truancy citation against a parent or um, a child, depending on the age, the magisterial district judge hears that as well. Yeah. Well, let's get everybody in, but then I think there are more connections we're going to build. Uh, Michael, would you tell us what a township commissioner does? Sure. Uh, thanks, Judith. And I apologize for some beeping in the back. If you don't know, we had 20 inches of snow. So there <laughs> we're aware, yeah. of our area in Hyde Park, which is very urbanized, if you're familiar with it. So mm. um, we're trying to get as much as we can out of the community. But uh, to answer your question from a township commissioner perspective, you're basically here to set policy, hire the right staff, and set a budget, similar to what Allison, I'm sure, does at the school district. And Gary, I'll talk about what he does. But as a, a local commissioner, borough councilman, a mayor, uh, we're usually about 10% of your entire tax dollar. So for uh, school district, county taxes, for the township taxes in, in our case, and uh, we try to take some pride. We get a lot of done with that uh, 10%. I mean, we are your police and fire. We are your, we pave your streets. We plow your roads. Um, you know, there's take care of the parks code enforcement, economic development, planning and zoning, a lot of things go into local government. And I think as you mentioned, uh, whether it's school or your local DJ, or it's important that uh, I always say, no one cares what political party you're in if they want their, their snow plowed, you know, over the last two days, they just want their snow plowed. So we kind of touch people, I think on a personal level, and we're almost all community service members, even if you're an employee, because you're out there touching the residents. They know who you are. You interact with them. And uh, you get a lot of calls and, and, and a lot of, you know, interaction with your community. And when you're in a position like this, and I can't believe it, but I think it's my 19th year now, um, that you get to uh, really understand what makes your community tick. And you see a lot of changes, but you just try to govern, I think, and make policy decisions that you think are the best in you. I always say you can't make decisions based on the 5% of the people who are never going to be happy. <laughs> so you try to do your best. I'm sure you all have been there. So I'm sure you try to do your best just to, to do what you would do to make sure the community keeps m moving forward. And um, I mean, on a whole, that's it is kind of what you put into it. You can get involved, try to make it better, or you can just come to a meeting once a month. But um, I think the commissioners or supervisors or people who really take it to heart can make some some real great changes in your community and help it grow. So um, it's very rewarding. It, it can be frustrating at times because you get a lot of stuff passed down on you by uh, our the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, that you have to comply with that cost money. And um, so, but but on and all, I think it's, you know, for me, it's been a very rewarding experience, but those are pretty much the issues that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But as a commissioner, you're really supposed to get the appropriate staff to do it in our township. You're not really supposed to be out there plowing roads or, you know, in a police car picking someone up. You're here to set policy and set the budget, at least in a first class township. So hopefully, Judith, that answers your question. And I look forward to uh, answering any questions or hearing everybody else. Thank you. Okay. Gary, how does what you do differ from what uh, he, he does as a township supervisor? You're a mayor in a borough. It's, it's How different is it? Well, basically, um, everything that Mike handles as a commissioner in Muhlenberg Township is handled by the borough council and mayor of Mountain. We have the same issues. We have the same uh, mandates. Uh, the difference is that 
the way the borough functions is defined by the uh, borough code. The borough code provides for who can run for office, who can serve, how long you can serve, all those kinds of things. Um, and it provides a strict definition of what the mayor is authorized to do and empowered to do and the borough council. Most of the function of a borough is handled through the borough council. It's a seven member body in, in the borough of Mountain. The, the mayor is primarily delegated the responsibilities for public health and safety. And the, the primary responsibility in, in Mountain that uh, I bear is the relationship with the police department and how the police department functions. <clears throat> um, so that's, I, I interact with the, the police chief and, and the borough council. I'm kind of the go between between the two. Um, the borough code is, is not totally clear on how those responsibilities are defined um, in that the, the mayor is, responsibility, is responsible for the conduct of the department, but the borough council sets the budget. So it's, it's kind of a, a give and take sharing kind of responsibility. Uh, among the things that that uh, we do that uh, Mike does as well <clears throat> that he didn't mention were our uh, subdivision land development planning uh, for the municipalities. And we also uh, deal with zoning uh, for individual uh, properties as well. Sounds like you've got your hands full, all of you. <laughs> um, from the discussion, um, I had a question in of how much time your job takes and judge butler you're a full-time and you're paid i assume a full-time salary would that be correct Are the, could the others of you tell me how much time this takes because i'm assuming you have other daytime jobs of some kind or some other form of support and is there any remuneration do we do, do the citizens actually pay you to do these jobs at all I, I can talk about um, as a school board member, um, I would say that you would typically um, spend two to three hours a week, um, mm -hmm. probably more if it's a week uh, of a board meeting um, to prepare, uh, to attend meetings. Their um, school directors do not get paid anything. They're, they are not a paid position. It's completely volunteer. Um, so as right now, I'm president of the school board, and I would say I probably spend 10 to 15 hours a week um, in, on that job because there is a lot of conversations um, with administration. Um, there are also attending um, professional development with the Pennsylvania School Board Association is a part of something that I do. And um, also we have retreats that we provide for our own school board members that are um, informational and, and helpful in them to, in making decisions that they do. So um, again, our board meeting weeks is a lot more time because we have to make sure that you're prepared for the meeting, that you've read through the minutes, um, that you've read through the agenda <laughs> and that you understand everything, that you've reached out um, to administration to ask questions. Um, and, and then the follow-up. And also talking to um, people of the community that call you and wanna share their thoughts and um, recommendations that they have. So um, yes, it's not a paid job and uh, most, most all school board members also have a full-time job. Mike, do you wanna chime in on what it's like for a township supervisor, how much time that takes and Sure, sure. For for us, the salary, I always joke, is three cents an hour, but we actually do get paid based on uh, the first class township code. There's a population ranges within the first class township code. So if you're five to 10 grand, you get this amount of money. If you're 15, you know, it's, it's defined specifically. I think for us, it may be, I don't know, about $4,000 a year. Don't quote me on that. I'm not quite sure because it's not something that obviously you would use as a full-time job. Quite frankly, many of the commissioners, including myself, try to give a lot of that back 
in advertisements or things that they can donate to our library, our ambulance association. So uh, obviously this, uh, these positions, you're not really, it's not something that you're gonna look to, you know, maintain some sort of employment off of. But to Allison's point, I mean, it, it is kind of what you wanna put into it, but you know, I'd say from three to five hours a week, definitely not counting the residents who will knock on your door or call you or text you or somehow get a hold of you. And meeting weeks are always a little tougher. I mean, we usually have probably about 200 pages of documents to go through with all of our different boards and, and besides the budget stuff on a meeting night. Um, so especially when it comes towards budget season. So that that's how it works for first class township code. I'm not quite sure about second class township. Gary can talk about his group, but first class you have you just really set entirely by statute. So there's no debate about it, which is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gary, what about for a mayor? Do you say how much how time do you spend per week, especially since you're dealing with the police, which is where you would connect most likely with the district justice time to time, the magisterial right. district justice? It it kind of varies um, depending on on um, what activities are happening. I mean, it 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 can be very sporadic. Uh, on a, a, a we have two meetings a week. Those weeks I can spend two two and a half hours a time. Um, the off weeks are probably an hour, hour and a half, uh, largely interacting with community and, and borough staff. Um, the compensation is uh, $50 a month, so it's $600 a year for the mayor and the president of council and for uh, all other councilmen, it is $500 a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question, I'm going to ask Allison first because our, our viewers should know she needs to be at school at 3 o'clock, so we're going to let her go early so she can be at school. Um, what made you decide to run for this position? Sure. So I'm actually an elementary school teacher. Um, so, you know, I am a strong believer in public education, and I just thought this that this was an opportunity to do that on a larger scale. Um, so... My, I have three children that are in our school district, and I also, they are actually um, at the high school, the middle school, and the elementary level. So I'm very involved in the school. Um, I know a lot of people, and I just thought this was an opportunity that I had of something that I knew a lot about and was very interested in. So um, I was actually appointed to the school board first, which is something that... Um, that school directors can do if there's a vacancy mid-year. Um, so I was appointed and then I ran for election um, after that appointment. And are you happy with your choice to do that? Yes, I am. It's been an interesting year, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, I'm very happy that I can do this. Mm -hmm. And we'll let you go because I know it's getting close to uh, looking at my clock. To okay. and you need to be on your way. Thank you All for right. joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And Judge Butler, tell us why you decided this was what you wanted to do. Well, I knew that we were losing 30 years of experience in my predecessor retiring. And I just felt that I had the demeanor, the knowledge and experience to do the job successfully, um, and to make a difference in my community. Professionally, I had been a Berks County public defender. I had also been in private practice. And at that point, most recently, I had been uh, an assistant city of Reading uh, solicitor. Um, so I got to work with the police. I worked with property maintenance. I had been in front of many magisterial district judges, you know, so I was well familiar with that court system. Um, personally, I also felt as though I had served in the roles that were going to come before me. I had been a victim. Um, I was robbed at an early age. I had also had my house burglarized and my car broken into multiple times. Um, but I had also served as a defendant in traffic cases. Um, so I understood that role also of being a, a defendant. 
I had been a tenant. I rented for three years prior to us buying our house. Um, but I also served as a landlord for a number of years. I'm a parent. My, I have two kids that went through Reading School District from elementary to um, high school and graduated from the high school. So I understand and I understood at that time what it's like getting your kids up for school and making sure that they're there on time and engaging with your teachers and your um, school administration. So I, you know, I knew that role as well. Um, and I lived in my house for 20 years. As magisterial district judges, we have to live in the area in which our, we serve, so where our district is. I lived in my house for 20 years at, um, at that point. And so it was like, I knew my community. I knew the needs of my community. Um, and so I just really thought that I, I was competent and that I would be successful. Thank you. Mike, what, what caused you to decide to do this? Um, yeah, I guess a, a long time ago, um, which is now is, you know, it was someone uh, who was on the board also. I had an ex school teacher who served on the board or was a school teacher at that time. They, were, they said it was the best way to get involved in your community. And they thought um, I had uh, an opportunity, you know, the first time you run, they say you're going to lose. I'm sure everyone hears that, but um, I was fortunate enough to win uh, the first time that I got on the ballot. And I just, it really, as corny as it may sound, you really just got to want to get wrapped up in your community and uh, learn about it and make some tough decisions about how to move forward because you really do control um, a lot of things and how your community looks are decisions that are made at the local level. And I thought that was important uh, to be able to be a part of that. And uh, that's why I did it. And I, 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 there was many times throughout though, you get, you know, some hard decision that can be frustrating. There are things that happen that are out of your control and, and you may want to quit, but sometimes it makes you work harder because, you know, going through the downturn of 2008 and how municipalities struggled and some of the things that have happened to us at the state level, uh, then when you get on it, you're almost to the point where I got to keep doing it and I want to finish this task and I want to keep seeing it grow. So uh, once you get a little taste of it, that how how it can be so gratifying to impact someone's life uh, directly instead of having to go through Harrisburg or, you know, go through the federal government, it can really, you know, you start to get a flavor for it and it really is a self-gratifying situation also. So uh, that was the decision I made was just to get involved back then. And uh, I've been fortunate enough ever since that to be able to help serve with a lot of good commissioners. I've had a lot of good, smart uh, folks who have been able to help move Muhlenberg forward. So, and I appreciate all of them. So that's that's been a, a wonderful 18, 19 years for me. Thank you. Gary, what motivated you the first time you ran? Well, it was really two things. Uh, first was family. My uh, father, is a former uh, member of the Mountain Borough Council. And actually he served, I, th I, I don't know how many uh, terms, but I think it was at least three. Uh, and during that time, he served for at least four years as the uh, president of the council. So I saw that as an example. Um, in my professional life, I'm a municipal engineer. And over the years, I've probably been to uh, meetings in 15, 20 municipalities. And I've seen the way uh, boards operate, the way uh, supervisors, commissioners, borough councilmen perform their duties. And uh, about 10 years ago, an opportunity opened up in the borough of Mountain where there was a vacancy for mayor. Um, as a municipal engineer, there are not a lot of elected positions that I can hold without having a conflict of interest. Mayor happens to be one of them. So I uh, jumped at the opportunity and ran for the position and the rest is history, as they say. So I know that 
and maybe not on the particular areas where you're all serving, but there are a lot of these seats that nobody runs for in different municipalities. What would you say to people about the potential for running for office? What, what advice would you give someone who's beginning to think about it? Oh, well, I'll answer. I would say research the position for sure. Research, know what it is that the position requires um, and the commitment that you would need to make for it. <clears throat> Once you set your mind that this is something that I want to do, go 100%. Like, don't be on the fence about it. Uh, make that your goal and go full steam ahead. Um, ask a lot of questions. I asked uh, a lot of people um, who were currently serving in the position, um, things like questions like how you asked us, how much time uh, do you, you spend? What is... Um, What's the hardest part of the job? What do you like the most about the job? Like, so just learn as much as you can about the position. Um, but then, like I said, once you decide in your mind, this is what I want to do, then it, it's not going to always be easy, um, especially when you have opposition. You can't, uh, a lot of stuff is on social media, so you, you can't, um, be too concerned about what your opponent is doing. You have to focus on your race and run your race to the best of your ability. Thank you. What What would you say? I'll go to Gary first. Well, as I said, I'm, I've been going to municipal meetings for an awful lot of years. And one observation I've made is that many of the people who run for office are doing so because something bothers them. Um, they, they, they want to go and get something fixed. Uh, and it, that can be uh, police, it can be uh, the road uh, maintenance, whatever. There, there's, there's loads of, of potential issues. Um, the real key is what do they do once they're elected and their issue is addressed? And um, what I would say to people is it, it may not be the best reason to get on a, a council or a board because you have some problem you want to deal with. It, it's best to, to look at the bigger picture and want to get onto a board to serve your community. And um, the advice um, from the judge about researching the position and, and what's involved is, is a um, really good advice. Uh, some of the best people coming on to these boards are the people who sit in the audience and see what their peers are doing. That, that, that's a, a great way to, uh, to learn about what happens in municipal government. Mike, what would you say? Well, I think Gary and the judge hit, you know, hit the nail on the head with everything. And, you know, it's quite disappointing uh, sometimes when you see <coughs> ballot positions and people not getting involved in the Gary's point, because they have one issue, um, you know, that tends to bring them to a meeting. But if you want to get involved and get involved, research it, do your homework. But I think, unfortunately, in this day and age, it's easier to try to legislate and, and critique behind the, the keyboard than it is actually to get in front of your, your residents and, and make tough decisions. So um, it, it's, I think, gotten harder and harder at the local level. Um, and I think that deters people from it because you are putting your decisions out there for, you know, the world to see and, and you don't, <laughs> you don't get many, you know, uh, pats on the back and you don't get a, many uh, that of boys for, for when you do something good. But, uh, and that's the tough part and people, you know, that work full-time jobs. Now many, you know, households have, you know, two uh, folks working in the household and are just trying to scrape by and they don't want to, you know, commit to that amount of time that has to be put into it. But 
Um, I would say for some people, you know, like for a township, you know, it's a four year term. I think if you, you research it, you wanna get involved, whether there are an issue or two that are on the top of your, your mind, I think, you know, it's well worth giving it get a shot. But talk to the people who have done it. Um, they're, they're happy to answer questions. People, I've learned to going to a lot of meetings because I handle a lot of insurance programs uh, for municipalities also. And to Gary's point, seen a lot of meetings, and you can tell the the board members who are engaged and know their community. You can tell some that are just want to be in the know and just want to be those people who think they have an edge up that they know something somebody else does. So I don't think that's the right reason to run. So I think if you talk to folks that have been doing it, like Gary, you can understand uh, what um, you know what you're in store for. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, we don't have any vacancies in this uh, municipal election, because you like to see people get involved. Yeah, I think it's important I mean, from the league standpoint to have the, the governments represent the people who are actually in those areas. And so we need a broad diversity of people who are running that would make the most sense for a, a good outcome. Um, we, you've all had in some way very specialized training. So the question I have next is, is specialized training needed? for the job you're in? And how do people who may be interested, how would they get that training? And since Allison is not here, I'm going to say that no, you do not need to be a school teacher to run for school board, that I know. <clears throat> and the Pennsylvania School Board Association does give classes on what you should know if you're interested in running for um, a school, school director position. So yes, in that area, I know training is available. The courses I think were given in January, but they'll be given again. So it would just be go to their website, Pennsylvania School Boards Association, and you can see what they offer for school board. So tell us, um, Judge Butler, you, you're you obviously a lawyer, but do you have to be a lawyer to be a municipal district judge? No, you do not. And, and in fact, in Berks County, there are only... 17 magisterial district judges that who are attorneys. Um, but if you are an attorney, you do not have to complete, you don't, you do not have to get certified to be a magisterial district judge. If you, did I say that right? If you are an attorney, you do not have to get certified to be a magisterial district judge. If you are not an attorney, then you have to complete um, a magisterial district judge certifying course, um, which it's my understanding right now, the last one they just did um, was virtual um, and you have to pass the test. So I believe the class is either three or four weeks long. Um, I think the class might be offered twice a year either once or twice a year. Um, it's my understanding that the class is free, but then you do have to complete uh, or pass a test um, for your certification. As, as I remember from when I did work in the courthouse, if you choose to take the class before you're elected, you pay for it. So you could certainly take that class, pay for it, know what you're getting into, and then make your decision is this something I want to do with my life or not? But if you are already elected, then the class is free. So that could have changed by now, but that's how it used to be, just for our viewers' information. And they could probably check that out by looking uh, online for that certification. Yeah. What about for, for boroughs and townships? What training do you get? Well, there's training available from the uh, Pennsylvania Association of Boroughs and the um, Pennsylvania Association of Township Supervisors. Uh, primarily, that's geared toward uh, people who have just been elected, uh, who are looking to hit the ground running. Uh, actually, also locally, the Center for Excellence in Local Government has a uh, class that they run uh, right after municipal elections. That uh, is also a good training tool. Again, that's geared toward people who have been elected, however. Mm -hmm. Mike, anything you want to add to that? 
No, just to Gary's point, I mean, we have an excellent organization and me and Gary serve on a board there together with the Center for Excellence in Local Government. Uh, and I think uh, they offer so many different programs for uh, so many different types of positions, whether they're on a planning board, a zoning board. Um, we're really blessed in Berks County to have that. And I believe, Gary, we're one of the only organizations in the state that has something like that locally. And, and they continue to uh, do and offer courses that can really help and bring people in who've done it and, and teach kind of real life scenarios for some things. So uh, we've been able to utilize that resource. I think it's tough to do anything before you're actually in office. I, I'm not, I, the first class township might offer something, but uh, it is, it does provide comfort. We have many uh, people who, who attend those elected officials who attend the classes at Albright. So we're lucky to have that resource here. Yeah, one of the benefits of, of the uh, Center for Excellence in Local Government, CELG, resource is that it combines officials from all different governing bodies. You have um, boroughs, uh, first class townships, townships of the second class, city. Um, you have planning members, you have zoning issue, uh, people. And it's just a, a blend that allows you to draw on a variety of um, uh, expertise sources. Mm -hmm. um, I had something I was going to say, but I lost track of it, but that's all right. Um, before we end the, the, the idea of, you know, people watching the program who might be thinking about running for office, um, one of the things you have to do to get on the ballot is file a nominating petition, which looks like this. And the standard measure for doing that is to go door to door and collect signatures. So if you were talking to someone running for office today, when we have this pandemic of COVID, what ideas could you give them for how they could safely collect signatures? None. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's the same thing you do when you uh, go to the supermarket and the same thing you do when you uh, go to um, a restaurant or whatever. Uh, social distance, wear a mask, be safe, be smart about what you're doing. And it should be no different doing that than any other activity. So you're going to be wearing your mask, carrying your hand sanitizer, and several pens if it's cold outside because the ink stops flowing. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, Judith, that's that's a tough situation to Gary's point. I mean, if you're willing to go to, you know, the supermarket, I think I've heard people getting creative now with, you know, having to invest in some cheap pens, and then they just give them the pen, they sign it, let them keep the pen, or they're putting it in their mailbox, because you only need 10, and in, in, for me, as township commissioner, I think it was 10, so you might leave it in your mailbox and have someone just, you know, come by and sign it. I know the judge probably has many more that, that the DJ has to get, but for us, it's really not a whole lot of signatures, so I heard a lot of folks trying to do that, either putting it in their mailbox and asking people that they know to come by and sign it, so... Uh, that that's one way also, but I, I agree with Gary. If you're being safe in other situations, you can be safe with the petition. And you need ten signatures for a township commissioner, ten for a borough office as well, Gary. That's correct. And school board is likewise ten. Do you have any idea? Do you remember, Judge Butler, how many signatures you had to collect when you ran? Yes. <laughs> All right. So as judges, you're able to cross file. Uh, and you need, if you decide to cross file, uh, you need 100 signatures for both parties. 106 for each party? For each party. Okay. And let's talk about this. Cross filing is something school boards do as well, but not done in townships or boroughs. Is, is that correct? Not done for City of Reading either. But for school districts, and I'm guessing that's because we want those to be completely impartial. So school boards can file as both as any of the main parties that we can register for in Pennsylvania and collect signatures in those parties and they would need 10 on each petition and judge candidates can do the same. So that, that would be correct? 
right. because Pennsylvania recognizes, I think, four different parties at the moment. Some parties aren't recognized, and those parties would have to get on after the municipal election through a nominating paper, which is different. But that's very fine too. So we won't we won't go there. But I should note that this being coming up as spring is the primary election. Everybody votes in their own party. So you're voting for who's going to represent your party on the ballot. But those ballot questions, everybody votes on them. So if you're registered uh, independently or with a party that's not an, an official party of the state, you still vote on those ballot questions. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, what would you say to voters who came out in great numbers in November to get them to come out again, to realize how much of their tax money, how much of their lives is intricately affected by the jobs you do? How would you, what would you say to them to bring them to the polls? Well, I know for magisterial district judges and quarter common pleas judges, we're affecting, and I'm, I'm, I'm certain that the Muhlenberg Township Commissioner and the mayor, mayor would say the same thing. We're affecting the people that you're putting into office are affecting people's lives. They're affecting your life. The decisions that we make on a daily basis uh, will affect your life. Um, and it is so important that you come out um, so that you have a, a say in who will make the decisions which will affect your life. Um, it was great in November. Um, definitely the you know the national um, positions affect our lives, but the local candidates really have an impact on your day to day. And I, I say keep the momentum going. Mike, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the uh, the items, Judith, that has flabbergasted me over the course of, of time is how, uh, to the judge's point, is we really do touch people's lives. What we can do can impact somebody within minutes and hours versus someone at the, the Commonwealth or someone at the federal level. If it's, you know, the street needs plowed or something needs to be done, you know, we, we can get it done rather quickly and we can change and be a little more flexible, obviously, as long as it's within the law and the statute and things we're able to do. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I still to this day just am amazed at some of the turnout sometimes because I don't know if it's, you know, local government isn't a big on television anymore or, or social media, you know, but it's just, it, to me, I, I would hope that people realize in this day and age that, um, you know, the people that, that are these volunteers or have paid a small stipend or are uh, going to look at your traffic ticket and do these things are going to be people you interact with in your community. So um, I don't know. I hope we do continue the momentum and, and hopefully get more and more out. So um, that that's all I can really add to that. Jerry, what would you add? Well, the only thing I would say is don't let it get to the situation that we had with the past national election. Um, people were polarized. People were upset. Um, you don't tend to see that a whole lot at local municipal government. And, you know, maybe that's because we're so much better than everybody in Washington, but I doubt that. Um, you know, I, I think that... Um, it's, it's better to be proactive and, and get the people you want there, uh, people you know, people you can trust, and um, not have it degenerate. And I will, will add to that in that um, when you're coming out to vote in the municipal election, you're voting for your neighbors. These are people you actually know, and that makes a big difference in how we all interact together. And I think I'd like to bring up one of my um, favorite uh, topics, which is parks. Now, the justice doesn't have much to do with our parks, but Muhlenberg Township and Mountain do have a lot to do with parks. I happen to live in Spring. We've got a lot of parks. And during the uh, epidemic, 
getting out to walk in a park is one of the safe things you can do. So those municipalities that have built their parks and have kept up their parks well are the ones that are our stars in today's parlance for, for that important function. And so when you have, you were talking about single agenda, and I would agree that single agenda candidates aren't the best candidates usually, but if your agenda were parks and you wanted to get involved with the municipality to help boost parks, that would be, you know, something reasonable to do. And you need to ask the candidates questions and look for the ones who are going to fulfill the needs you feel you have as a community. So I'm going to take, uh, we have just a few minutes left, any final comments you'd like to make, and then I will close out with some more information on the upcoming uh, election. So who, who was, uh, would like to make some final comments? Everybody stay I, I would just make the comment that uh, I, I would encourage anybody who has any interest in municipal government to, to at least research it, get involved, figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had people uh, just come on to the Moton Borough Council who were uh, active uh, observers who are continuing to learn and continuing to be surprised at, at what they're finding out. So, yeah. And are Take your council steps. meetings on, on virtual at this point? Yeah, it varies. Uh, mountains are all virtual. Um, we've had a couple, uh, we, we've had one uh, planning commission meeting that was a mix, uh, but for the most part, yes, virtual. And are those available that anybody in Moton can get on to, to watch the meeting? Yeah, I believe the um, uh, connection information is posted on our website and um, you're allowed into the meeting by the, the host. So that way it would be a good way for people to do their observing now. Yeah. Uh, it'd be easy. You can do it from the, you know, being at home, you don't have to drive. So that would work. Mike, how about you do, what is, are your meetings virtual as well? Oh yeah, we have a little bit of the high hybrid also. Well, right now the board members are actually in the meeting room. You can see behind me and we take questions, but they're all recorded. We try to take questions in advance in order to have the meeting at, at least run a little smoother than having people on the, the Zoom. Um, I'm sure we'll get a lot more of this meeting because of the snow cleanup that we're dealing with. But uh, yeah, they're all out there to view and to, to the mayor's point is you can go view them and see what it looks like. You can kind of get a feel for how, what happens at a meeting and, and make a determination from there. But yeah, we're hoping to get back to uh, hopefully sooner than later to in-person meeting. I think that's important at our level. A Zoom, I know we're doing it out of an abundance of caution. We actually had, I think four meetings outside at Jim Dietrich Park so we could have residents come and socially distance. Cause I do think in our roles, it's important to be, you know, in person as much as you can. So we can't do that yet, but hopefully if we, you know, we have to go outside again in April, we'll probably do that again. So people would have that opportunity to come see meetings and see what it is you're doing. And also to get to judge whether they like the job you're doing and know who they want to vote for the next time the election comes up. And Jed Beschel, are you virtual or are you actually in court these days? You're in court, aren't you? It's actually both. My court is open to the public. And so I do have people to come in um, for in-person hearings. But then also we will do virtual hearings for people who are incarcerated or um, people who, you know, their attorney request or they request um, not to come into the courthouse because of COVID concerns, we will accommodate them. Um, and to answer your question real quick, um, as far as a final word, I would say to people, you don't have to be a politician to run for uh, an office. The three of us here, we are everyday people who just cared, uh, wanted to make a difference in our community. And we filed the petition and put our, put our sign out and we ran for office. But I, and I know for myself, I'm not a politician. 
And that's probably why we're the best public servants, because it's 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 uh, about the community more than it's about you. And that's what works best for most of us, I think. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank my guests. We have Judge Tonya Butler, who is with the district court, uh, Mike Muhlenberg, who is with Mike, Mike Milankoski, who's with the Muhlenberg Township Commissioner, and Gary Kraft with the Moton Bureau. And if we can go back to our last slide, oh, I don't have the BCTV person here to bring up the last slide. Let's see if we can, I don't know. Oh, it's up, great. So let me first note that if you're deciding to run for an office, February 16th is the first date to circulate the nominating petitions. And you have to have that circulating done by March 9th. And I will note from a person who has done that, they always pick the coldest three weeks of the year. That seems to be the standard, <laughs> pick the coldest three weeks of the year. Um, if you're just tuned in and you've said, yes, I do need to vote for my neighbors. I do need to make sure I have good people serving in these seats. May 3rd is the last day to register to vote. So make sure you're registered by May 3rd. And May 18th will be the primary municipal election. And if you have questions about all of this, please send them to Lee, LWVBurksCO at gmail.com. So if you're interested, we will help connect you to the resources you need. There are tons of resources online and you can make yourself, avail yourself of those so you can make your decision and uh, we will be doing uh, candidates up front in cooperation with BCTV to cover some of the main races in the county. We only cover contested races, but we're also going to be trying a, a new project, which would be interviewing candidates in contested races and putting those uh, on our website. So if you, uh, you know, we will doing that. If you write to us and say, please cover my area because there are some issues here that are big issues, we will look at covering your area and seeing if we can't cover the candidates who are running in your area on the, our website. So we're open to trying new things as much as we can. So we want voters to vote. Um, we had a great voter turnout in November and our communities will all be stronger if we get the same turnout this spring and fall. Thank you and good day. Thank you.